Uh, my name is Luke. I'm one of the pastors here, and welcome to Ironwood. Uh, putting together this sermon uh, made me think about the last time I punched someone in the face. <laughs> I was uh, 18 years old. I had graduated high school. It was the uh, weeks before I headed off to college, and I had been a college baseball, or I was heading into being a college baseball player, but in my senior year, I had torn my labrum in my shoulder, had to have surgery on it and was doing all this rehab. And you know, when you have an injury like that, you sort of want it to be like when you fix something in a car, right? Like you want to open the hood, put in the new thing and off it goes. But that's not how it is with surgery. And so I was healing and doing the rehab and doing all the exercises. And you know, I'd been wearing a sling for a long time. And I go to this party. It was like a going away party for one of my buddies, a bunch of people there. And um, it was the first time that I was able to, after surgery, go without wearing a sling. So I was really excited about it. Well, at some point during the party, a bunch of people decided it would be super fun if we just started throwing people in the pool. And so, you know, at first a couple of people threw their friends in the pool and then it was like, we're just going to throw anybody in the pool is apparently what someone decided. And so this kid who was a year younger than me, but like really big, really strong football player, linebacker kid, um, he, I just happened to be near him. And so he grabs me by my arm that has just been surgically repaired and he's going to like yank me into throwing me in the pool. And I'm like, stop, stop, stop. I just had surgery. I just had surgery. Stop, stop. And he doesn't let go. And so I turned around and <laughs> punched him left-handed in the side of the face and he let go. And so that worked. <laughs> and then uh, his buddies were like, uh, hey, you might want to leave this party. And I was like, I was kind of thinking the same thing. I would love to leave. And uh, you know, it, it was just, my shoulder was fragile. I was doing so much to help it get better. It was like, oh, I can't afford a setback, setback like that. And it's the same thing in our relationships. Our relationships are fragile. And when they get hurt, and sometimes it takes a while for them to start to recover. And you start to experience some recovery and then ah, it starts to hurt again. And it's just a fragile thing. And yet they're really, really important. We said a couple weeks ago that our, the quality of our lives is really only as good as the quality of our relationships. Which is why when our relationships hurt, life really hurts. When our relationships are broken, life feels really broken. When relationships are heavy and weighty, life feels really heavy and weighty. It's just how it is. And so in this series where we've been focusing on relationships, we want to confront this particular lie today that time heals all wounds. Time heals all wounds. You hear people say that when something goes wrong. And, and here we have in mind not just all the different kinds of wounds. There's lots of ways that life can wound us. Here we in particular have the idea of relational wounds, relational breakdowns, relational problems. Time heals all wounds, we say. We want to believe that. And on one hand, there's some truth in it, right? Like there is something about giving something a little more time can give you a little more perspective. If you're a follower of Christ, it can give you time to pray. It can give you time to reflect and give you time to kind of filter and sift, right? You might go, well, I really reacted big in a moment, but then, you know, I gave it a little bit of time and I realized, okay, this isn't that big of a deal. Or, you know what, I actually was able to clarify what really upset me, right? So time can be helpful, on the other hand, sometimes time makes it worse. Sometimes when there's a real breakdown in a relationship, giving it space creates room for more distrust, more assumptions, more bitterness, more misunderstanding, right? Then you start analyzing, did she look at me funny? I think he looked at me weird. I think, right, what's going on? What do they really think, right? And you start, right, we experience this in like trivial things relatively. Like, you know that time when you like have a text message, you haven't texted someone back or you, you owe someone a phone call and you haven't called them. Now, like over time, over time, that call gets harder to make. So time doesn't heal all wounds. Here's the truth that we want to focus on today is that relational wounds need relational healing. Relational wounds need relational healing. Time isn't going to do it. You've got to have some sort of mending of the relationship, right? If you think about uh, someone who maybe gets stabbed with a knife, interestingly, the only way to, to probably be fully healed from a stab wound, a deep stab wound especially, would be to actually go under the knife again surgically. 
You need something to make it better. And the deeper the cut, the deeper the surgery. And that's why relationships, and that's why trying to heal relationships actually is so hard and it feels so risky. A lot of times like a a relationship is is bad, but you're actually thinking like, I don't want it to be worse. And I tried to mend it up, but it just, the, the phrase we use is, it reopened the wound. And it hurts to reopen a wound. So sometimes we want to believe, well, if time heals all wounds, it'll just get better. But relational wounds need relational healing. And I've been thinking about this recently um, because I uh, had an injury probably five or six weeks ago. Um, and, uh, you know, I just woke up one day and my foot and my ankle were just, my left, was just super sore, super like swollen. And uh, it was like, what, what happened? What did you do? And it turns out what I did was, it, uh, it's called TMB. Uh, too many birthdays is what it stands for. <laughs> Um, And when you have TMB, what happens is all of a sudden parts of your body start hurting for no real reason that you can tell. Um, And so, you know, I'm hobbling along, bad case of TMB. And it turns out what actually happened was um, I have some tendonitis in the peroneal tendons. And those are the ones that run along the side of your shin. And they go down around your ankle, kind of through your foot. And uh, just, I'd had kind of a normal week of, you know, hanging out, being active, doing stuff that I would normally do. And for whatever reason, it just like really flared up and acted up. And so I, I went to the chiropractor and I knew it probably wasn't a chiropractor thing. And I went to the physical therapist and uh, they helped me see like, yeah, this is probably what this is. And so I've been going every week to physical therapy and I've been doing exercise and I've been kind of trying to heal this part of my body that's not working right. And it's got me thinking about how does healing work? What does it look like to, to heal from an injury? Because while I'd love to just take the pill and have it be over, it doesn't really work like that. And so that really is how I'm going to frame what we're going to look at here from Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians 3, uh, Paul is, the, the Apostle Paul, uh, he, he'd been talking in the first few chapters about the identity. Here's who you are in Christ. And now he's saying, here's how to live. And the here's how to live has a lot of expectations about relationships. And as we really look at verses 12 to 14, I think what we find, we can actually draw out of it a kind of like, here's some physical therapy for your relationships. Here's some physical therapy. Here's some exercises to do to help you be more healthy in your relationships, especially when they hurt. And so this is really important. This is not step by step. It's not do number one and then do number two and then do number three and then do, and you'll never have to go back to number one. No, this is more like physical therapy. These are like exercises that you just are going to have to keep doing. These are going to be a regular part of your life, a regular part of your rhythm, a regular part of how you think and how you live. That's how it is. And it's interesting with physical therapy. Some physical therapy, like what I've been doing, is restorative, right? Here's this injury. This is restoring you to a place of health. Other physical therapy is preventative, Right? Especially if you had an injury and now you're, you, you know, some of you, you hurt your back at one point and you got a bunch of back stretches to do and those stretches and those exercises, they helped your back get better. And, and so now you've already recovered, but you keep doing the stretches because it's going to prevent things. It was funny after the last service, these four uh, young, tall, you know, really like with it people came up to me and they're like, thank you for speaking up for physical therapists. It's like, well, that's not really what I was doing, but nice to see you. And, uh, and I said, did you all meet each other in PT school? And they said, yeah. And I said, uh, I said how, how long does it take? Like, how hard is it to tell whether someone didn't do the exercises? And they're like, oh, half a second. You know, because what you say is like, hey, just do it like you did it at home. And they give you the blank stare. And you're like, yeah, you don't know what you're doing. Right? And, and that's the thing is we want to get better. Like, I know plenty of people are like, I want to get better. And you saw the therapist and they gave you the things. And you're like, it still hurts. And you're like, did you do the exercises? Well, no. All right. Well, that's a you problem, right? That's not. So, so these are exercises. They're things that are going to just have to constantly be part of our lives. There's not a one and done. It's less, get this, it's less step by step. It's more day by day. All right? So that's what we're going to see in this passage is five exercises to provide more healing and wellness and health in our relationships. All right? Uh, Let's look at the first ones. It's in verse 12. And the first exercise is this. Remind yourself about yourself. This is something you need to do regularly is remind yourself about yourself. Who are you? 
Who's the deepest you? What's your core identity? What makes you you? And for the follower of Christ, we have a different answer than those who don't follow Christ, right? The way that most people experience identity in our modern culture is you have to achieve your identity, right? You, you, what you do is you actually, you go deep within yourself and then you build an identity out from there. The Christian understanding of identity is totally different. Rather than looking into yourself, you look out to what Christ says about who you are and then instead of taking this from outside of you and then projecting projecting it on the world, what you do is you say, here's this thing that God says is, in, is there, I'm going to drive it deep within my heart. You move it the other way. You remind yourself about yourself. Now, in uh, Colossians chapter 3, what we have, before he's going to get into any specific instructions, he's going to remind us, here's who you are. This is the true you. This is your identity. And what he's going to say is, put on then as God's chosen ones. This just means that God set his heart on you. He set his affection on you. He loved you before you loved him, right? You love, first John said, we love because he first loved us. God chose you. By the way, that's important to mention as you look at all the places in the Bible where God talks about the choosing, it's never clear why God chooses. And it's certainly clear that God doesn't choose because he sort of looked through humanity and went, man, who would be a real stud on my team? But in fact, in 1 Corinthians, it says God chose the lesser things. God chose the sinners and the scoundrels and the weak things. Because that makes him look really great. With the people of Israel, God says, I didn't choose you because you were like bigger than everyone else. Actually, because you were smaller. It's actually when God takes us kind of raggedy things and makes us look good, it makes him look good. So this is who you are. This is who you are. You're chosen. You're chosen ones. God set his heart on you. You're also holy Holy, holy is to be set apart, it's to be consecrated for some sort of sacred use, for the service of God. And if you're a follower of Christ, that's who you are. You're holy, you're chosen, you're holy, and you're beloved. You're beloved. What I love about all three of these words, chosen, holy, beloved, none of them are things that we do to ourselves. They're all things God has to do to us. God sets his love on us. God makes us holy. Now you go like, I don't feel very holy. I had kind of a rough week. All right, yeah. Because holy means to be set apart from sin. But here's the reality. Because of the gospel, because of what we believe about what Jesus did, what the scriptures declare is that you are declared holy when you put your faith in Christ. When Jesus went to the cross, all of your sins were put on him. And all all your sin fills up his account. And all of his righteousness fills up your account. And now you are declared before God in the sight of God to be holy. By the way, this is the only reason you could have eternal life when you die. Because if it only is your record, you ain't getting in. But when we die, we stand before the Lord and we say, it's not about me, but it's about what Jesus did. And you've, God declared me holy. And he's like, great, come on in. So you're holy. Now, the the process of of life, the theological word for it is sanctification. It's the process of becoming in your actual life like you are already declared to be. But you're declared to be holy and you're beloved. This is who we are. We're not orphans anymore because of our sin. We've been adopted by the grace of Christ. And if you talk to people who've uh, done adoption and adopted or been adopted, especially people who've adopted kids out of really tough situations, one of the things you find is it's very hard for those kids to accept how loved they are. It's hard for those kids to believe how loved they are. And it's the same thing as for us, but we're not orphans. We're adopted, we're sons. We're daughters. And our capacity to love in relationships is going to depend a lot on how much we understand that we are loved. And what he starts out is at the very beginning, before he instructs us to do any more exercises, he says, hey, remind yourself about yourself. This is who you are. And then here goes the second exercise. The second exercise is also in verse 12. It's then act like yourself. All right, that's who you've been declared to be. Remind yourself about yourself. Now act like yourself. Don't act like the old you. Don't act like the, the, the person who, who you aren't anymore. Act like who you are. And the way he uses this language is he says, put on then. Put on. It, it's the language of clothing. And he's actually been using it already in this chapter. Uh, back up in chapter 3, verse 5, he said, put to death what is earthly in you. In verse 8, he said, now you must put these sins away. It's the idea of taking off this clothing and putting on 
this other clothing. So one of the things that I had to do, I realized last week, actually I wore some shoes last week and I like them, they look good. But after last Sunday, I was like, my foot hurt so bad. It felt like I had almost started over. And I realized that the, the shoe I had just, it wasn't supportive. It, it was old and it was ragged. So I, have to, I had to throw it away and I had to get some new shoes. So yeah, so cool. And I don't care how they look, I just, they feel great. Right, that's kind of it right now. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, hey, th- there's an old way of living for you. It doesn't fit you anymore. It's not working anymore. It's actually just making your life hurt worse. Get rid of that. Put on this other way of life. Okay, what's th- w- what are we supposed to put off? That's maybe what we should talk about first. We put to death in verse five, uh, what's earthly in you, sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness. And then in verse eight, it's put, put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. So that's the stuff you're supposed to put away. Don't live like that anymore. Get rid of that stuff. But put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. The word meekness means gentleness. So, so here's, the new, here's the new shoes that are going to help you get through this injury. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness or gentleness, patience. All right, Sunday school question of the day. Who does that remind you of? Jesus. That's right. That's exactly right. Right, that, now, that's not, right, like Jesus also was tough and Jesus was going to confront stuff, right? But, but there's this sense of Jesus that like, and what's at the core of Jesus, what makes Jesus so amazing is really what's at the center of these words, right? The fifth of the five words, the one right in the middle is this word humility. It's humility. That's what makes Jesus the most amazing because Jesus is God, but doesn't like try to make a big deal about that as much as he puts on the role of a servant, Right? And, and that's why he'll say in verse 14, above all these, put on, there's that same idea again, put on love. You can't have love without humility. Because love is, is saying, I'm going to put your needs ahead of my own. Humility is saying, I'm going to put your needs ahead of my own. Right? So what he's saying really is put on Jesus. And that's actually the language that Paul uses in Romans chapter 13, verse 14. He says this, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. He goes, this, you had this old way of living. And the old way of living as it relates to relationships. Again, that's the context here. As it relates to relationships, th- this old way of living is, is reactive and it's quick and it's hard Right? Look at the words. If you have your Bible, look at it. I don't have this on the touch screen. Look at verse eight. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk. Right? This is all like, like something hits you and you hit back. The, the, the picture that pops in my head with this is, is when you're in the flesh, when you're living like the old you, you're like a trampoline. Something hits you and it just bounces right back at them. Something lands on you and wham, just right back, right back, right back. Oh yeah? Oh yeah, will you? Oh yeah, well, right? That's what it is, right? This new life of Christ is, is more like you're like a foam pit. You know those things, the gymnasts, they, you know, do the razzle dazzle into the foam pit. It's just to say like, rather than being reactive, he's saying, hey, this, this new you, the true you is... It's not reactive. There's a softness. There's a tenderness. There's a, there's a quietness. That's the true you. And again, at the center of it is humility. And so, so, so get this. This doesn't mean, by the way, because one of the things we think this means, it's that I can never confront anything in anyone else. I just need to always absorb it like the foam pit. No, because when Jesus, one of the things he, he does when he talks about actually confronting a difficulty in a relationship, and we'll see it more in a minute, in Matthew chapter seven, there's a place where Jesus says, hey, uh, when you notice a speck in someone else's eye and you want to take the, that out, just remember that you have a log in your eye. Now, what a lot of people think is, well, if I have a log in my eye, then I can't say anything about their speck. But that's not what Jesus says. What Jesus says is first, take the log out of your own eye 
and then address the speck in your brother's eye. In other words, you're still going to address it. You're still going to speak up. You're still going to be honest. You're still going to say, hey, this hurt me. You're still going to say, hey, that was wrong. But you're going to do it from a place of humility, from a place of compassion and kindness and patience and gentleness and love. It's going to be totally different. So exercise number two, act like yourself. First, remind yourself about yourself. Second, act like yourself. Here's exercise number three. Put up with as much as you can. When it comes to relationships, just put up with as much as you can. That's the gist of the beginning of verse 13, right? Having put on these compassionate hearts and kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. Bearing with one another. This word literally uh, means to endure, to tolerate, to put up with. It, it has the idea of holding back. Right again, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, there's a lot we're just gonna absorb. How many of you know, like, that's what makes relationships hard, is all the stupid stuff that people have to absorb. Well, here's what I'm grateful for. I'm grateful that I have a bunch of people in my life who are willing to put up with me. It is not easy. I'm quirky. So are you. Right, like Molly and I have this whole, like, this different, she has one pillow. I've got more. Like, the, you know, the one I have at home is this foam cooling pillow. It's very... You know, it's great and, you know, but it, it makes travel hard, right? We go to the hotel and, excuse me, can you send up 18 pillows? And I got to get it all set. And she's just is like, oh my goodness, right? She just bears with me. Uh, I, I have this like uh, unbelievable gift, that's how I see it, to uh, know and be able to pick the perfect song for whatever moment I'm in. And so uh, my family is often enduring me picking, the, so like we just dropped our daughter off at college a couple weeks ago. Uh, their, their mascot at Wheaton College is the Thunder, Wheaton Thunder. So I'm like, easy, this is perfect. So we're like about to pull in the driveway to, you know, drop her stuff off. I roll the windows down, ACDC thunderstruck, turn it up loud, thunder. And she's like, dad, 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 stop, stop, stop. And I'm telling you, it was perfect. And she had to endure it. I turned it off. I don't like to pack until the day of leaving the trip. See, some of you are already having to endure me. <laughs> I don't like this guy, right? I, I, I watch TV with the remote in my hand and I can never exactly dial in the right volume. So it's constantly going up and then it's going down and it's going up and then it's going down. It's like a whole, like, listen, it, there's just a lot about each other. We're annoying. Aren't you glad that people put up with you? And so that's what he's saying is like, just, there's just a lot about relationships. It's just, I mean, in the end, nobody wants like, hey, my goal in life is mostly to just be tolerated. Nobody wants that. And yet, can you imagine if you weren't tolerated? So, so this is just, we got to just put up with a lot. Now, here's the fourth exercise then, is address what you can't or shouldn't put up with. So if you put up with a lot, put up with as much as you can, there also then has to be a time when you address what you can't put up with or address what you shouldn't put up with. And now those are different things, right? Something is like, hey, this has now crossed the line. I could endure this at this level, but I can't endure this at this level and it just bothers me too much. I need to address it, right? There's other things you're totally capable of, of enduring it, but you shouldn't. You should not let him treat you that way. You should not let her say that. You should not allow that kind of manipulation or oppression or abuse to continue. It is not loving. And they might have actually convinced you that you're the problem, right? They've put it on you and you go like, well, maybe I'm just too weak. And, and you could endure it, but you shouldn't. It's not loving to someone else to let them continue to sin against you. And so at some point, something crosses a line. And, and the Bible here has a category for that. And it's this, in verse 13, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Some things rise to the level of being a complaint. 
Okay, you now crossed the line. You now did something. This deserves blame. That's what this word uh, complaint means. It doesn't just mean like you had thin skin. It's like, no, something that is blameworthy just happened. What do you do? Well, what Paul does, and what I love the example here in this passage, is he's comfortable naming it. Right? It's not just kind of vague, you know, well, you might have hurt me. No, he, he's able to say exactly what it is, right? In verse 5, he lists a bunch of specific names of specific sins. In verse 8 and verse 9, he does the same thing, right? There's a difference in Paul's mind, right? They're, they're related, but there's a difference between anger and wrath and malice and slander and obscene talk and lying, and he's able to name it. And we, one of the things we need to be able to do when something is crossed the line is be able to go, okay, well, what is it? What is actually, what actually happened? What actually hurt me? What actually offended me? What actually, it, how was I sinned against? And to try to put na- language to it. And one of the things that happens is, is one of my counselors says, you know, you have to name it to be able to tame it. Because naming it actually, it, it, it goes, it, it gets specific and it kind of lowers the temperature a little bit. And I found this actually as I'm going through physical therapy, like, like my th- physical therapist will say, hey, when you do such and such, does that hurt? And I'll say, well, yeah, I mean, it, but it's not like a, it's not a shearing pain. It's more like an aching, radiating pain. And that actually helps him because he's able to like go, oh, okay, well, in light of that. And one of the things he told me is like, it's really helpful to have someone who's like kind of in tune with like, here's what I'm actually feeling. Here's what I'm actually, here's what actually happened. So we have to address what we can't put up with and we have to address what we shouldn't put up with. Now, there's a number of ways that we mess this up, that we get this wrong, that we screw up this exercise. The first one is by thinking that the Christian thing is to always bear with it, right? We, we listen to the first half and we just go, well, I just gotta bear with it. I just gotta endure it. That's the Christian thing. The Christian thing is always to be compassionate and kind and humble and meek and patient, but actually the, the courageous thing and the loving thing might be to, to confront it. And so we make that mistake, we just ignore it in the name of taking the high road, we're actually dishonest. And what that does is it actually creates more bitterness and more hurt and it makes the thing harder to heal. So that's the first thing we do that's a problem. The second thing we do is a problem is uh, we just take too long to realize what we actually feel about it. And this is normal, this happens, but this is how it tends to work. You go, you know what, I'm just enduring it. I'm just enduring it just enduring it, just enduring it, I'm just enduring it, I'm enduring it, and right, someone in your life might go, it feels like you're not enduring it anymore, right, and, or, or you don't even realize it until you explode, right, and, and what happened was you were trying to do the first part of verse 13, but we've got to like be able to realize, you know what, this actually has crossed the line. This actually, right? And you, a lot of times you start to feel that in your body. You start to feel that when you get impatient. You start to feel that when you can't sleep very well at night anymore because you're thinking about it. You start to realize it when it's affecting your, your appetite. You start to, right? You, there's ways to start to notice these things, but we've got to start to notice it because we just kind of, we hold on. And, the, and now it feels to the other person like we've been keeping this long record of wrongs when what it is is we've just been kind of trying to endure it. And now we realize I just can't anymore. Here's a third thing that we do that is kind of a problem. I think this is pretty common in, in church community, church life, because we're a people who value uh, counsel. We value wisdom, right? And so a lot of times what'll happen is someone will hurt you and rather than addressing the thing, right? You get the log out of your eye and then you address the speck. What you do is you gather, you get together with four or five people to go, hey, I think I noticed a speck. Do you notice a speck? Do you notice a speck? What do you think? Do they have a speck? What would be a wise way to address the speck? I don't know if they're going to like me addressing the speck. What do you think? What do you, right? And now, and now you, you've kind of built this coalition and built this group, and now it's like a thing that probably didn't need to get that big. You could have just addressed it. The fourth thing that we do when we're on the receiving end of the complaint, and this one's a huge problem, is when someone actually then builds up the courage to address, hey, I think you hurt me in this way, but they don't necessarily like address it to us in the perfect way, we dismiss their complaint because they didn't handle it perfectly. Because they were a little mean, or they were a little emotional, or they were a little whatever. And we deflect the way we've hurt them and the impact we had on them because they didn't bring it to us exactly right. All of these are what make relationships so hard. 
and more. We could think of more examples. But we've got to address when we notice, okay, this has crossed the line. This isn't good. This isn't wrong. This isn't healthy. I can't endure this anymore. I don't want to endure this anymore. I shouldn't have to endure this anymore. Paul says, okay, when you have a complaint, realize it's a complaint. Address it. Now, the fifth exercise is where he finishes in verse 13, and that is to forgive and keep forgiving. Forgive and keep forgiving. So he says, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Right? Three times this idea of forgive, forgive, forgive. And this word forgive, it means to, uh, to show favor. It means to give freely. In other words, you, you don't ever owe someone forgiveness, right? Because what forgiveness is, is saying, I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to give you favor. You broke this thing. And rather than making you pay for the thing you broke, I'll pay for the thing you broke, right? Imagine someone comes over to your house and they're sitting in your chair and they lean back and <laughs> the chair leg breaks. Right? And you could say, hey, man, I'm going to need to buy a new chair. Can you send me the money? And you would be every, you'd have every right to do that. You could also say, hey, I'll take care of it. And what that means is I will pay the cost. Listen, in forgiveness, it, when there's a relational breakdown, someone always pays the cost. And what Paul says is when you have this complaint, what you want to do is, a, is pay the cost. You want to give forgiveness. Why? Because the Lord has forgiven you. You had sinned against God. You had rebelled against God. You had broken the rules against God. You had mistreated God. You had mistreated others. You'd mistreated people made in God's image. And God in his grace, because of what Christ has done, has forgiven you. He has. It's washed away. Your sins are forgiven. And if you've experienced that kind of forgiveness, what Paul is saying, that the, that the flinch of your heart needs to, over time, as you develop this exercise, be to forgive. Now, what's really interesting is when he says, if one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other, that word forgiving, it's a present tense word in the Greek. What it means is you don't stop doing this. This is not a one-time thing. A lot, a lot of times you go, well, I did forgive them, but I'm struggling to think it counted. <laughs> no, you keep forgiving. You keep forgiving. Now, th this is the key thing, is there's a big difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. And this is what makes relationships especially hard, right? F forgiveness is a one-way street. Reconciliation is a two-way street. You could think about it, some people have described it this way, that forgiveness is vertical, right? It's me forgiving you before God. Like in my prayer, I go, Lord, I forgive them. In my heart, I say, Lord, I forgive them. But I'm, but I'm not gonna tell you I forgive you until you acknowledge what you did and you ask for forgiveness and you accept that the impact you had on me was negative. Like I, I, can't, I can't reconcile with you. I can't forgive you horizontally like, hey, I forgive you until you've acknowledged it. Right, so in that way, forgiveness is a one-way street. I'm going to have a heart of forgiveness because Christ has had a heart of forgiveness to me. And, and before the Lord, I'm going to do everything I can to fight against bitterness and to fight against anger and to fight against rage and to fight against that stuff. And I'm going to, in my heart, do my best to forgive you. But I'm going to bring this concern to you. And if you don't acknowledge it, then again, I'm going to try to not have a hard heart toward you but our relationship is always going to be a little broken. F forgiveness is a one-way street. Reconciliation is a two-way street. Forgiving them as Christ has forgiven you. And this is a big deal. And it's really, really hard. And you go, man, I, I don't know if I can forgive. Well, here's one more reason why you might want to forgive. You know that Lord's Prayer that we do? <laughs> And when Jesus was asked by his disciples, say, hey, teach us to pray. And there's the part where when you're reciting it in public, you're never quite sure. Are we going to say debts? Are we going to say trespasses? <laughs> right? And, and it's so distracting to think about that that you actually forget the point. Do you know what the point of that part of the prayer is? Do you, do you remember what it is? Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Here's what that means. That means God forgive me as in the same way that I forgive others. So God used the same standard that I use on other people 
on me. That's a scary prayer if you're not willing to forgive. Again, it, it might mean you never reconcile. It might mean the relationship has to permanently be different. There are consequences. But, but the heart of forgiveness is a big deal. So again, these are the exercises. These are the things. Like, again, it's not steps. It's not step by step. It's day by day. And yet, what we have to be honest about, what we have to acknowledge, is that not every wound in this life gets fully healed. You're gonna do these exercises for the rest of your life. And there's gonna always be some relationships that still hurt. This was talked about in the last book of The Lord of the Rings. Which I had a chance to read earlier this spring for the first time, it was pretty amazing. And in the last book, uh, Frodo is feeling this ache, and the ache he feels is because early on in the journey, he had been stabbed by a Nazgul, the, one of the dark lords, stabs him in this, with this sword. And it's like he's now, like the adventure's happened, he's back in the Shire, and it's a year later, and the shoulder starts to ache again. And a lot of us know what that's like, don't we? There's that time of year that reminds you of who you lost. There's that song that comes on and then you go, I love this song, oh wait, that hurts. There's a certain smell, there's a certain place. And you might go, yeah, I've forgiven in my heart and we've done the best we can, but this thing still hurts. Here's what Tolkien writes. Are you, in frame, are you in pain, Frodo? Said Gandalf quietly as he rode by Frodo's side. Well, yes I am, said Frodo. It is my shoulder. The wound aches. The memory of darkness is heavy on me. It was a year ago today. Gandalf said, alas, there are some wounds that cannot be wholly cured. I fear that it may be so with mine, said Frodo. There is no real going back. Though I may come to the Shire, it will not seem the same, for I shall not be the same. I am wounded with knife, sting, and tooth, and a long burden. Where shall I find rest? And it says, Gandalf did not answer. Some wounds cannot be wholly cured in this life. Some relationships are just going to always hurt. But we know the answer that Gandalf didn't give is that someday... <laughs> Jesus, who was wounded for our transgressions, will come, and the scriptures say he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. But until that day, you gotta do your exercises. Let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you for your grace, and thank you that your grace comes from a place of understanding that you know what it was like to be abandoned by friends, you know what it was like to be betrayed by friends, you know what it was like to have people that you deeply cared about and enjoyed to turn on you. And Lord, I know that feeling and many of us do. Lord, I also know the feeling of having hurt someone and been given the incredible gift to repair it. So I pray, Lord, that that would be us, that we'd be able to give the gift of healing and that you would use these truths to help us walk in greater health. In Jesus' name, amen.